You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Johnson. The AfterBuzz Studios in Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menounos and Bing.com. And streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies, this is After Buzz at the Movies! Welcome, welcome everybody. Bing is for doing, and we are here doing After Buzz at the Movie for the 2013 Neil Blomkamp movie, Elysium. This will be spoiler. Um, spoiler a lot, Yes, a lot of spoilers, but this is not going to be a review. We're going to have a thorough breakdown of this awesome 2013 sci-fi movie. Let's get I am into your it. host, Marissa Serafini, and joining me, I have... Dimitri Panos, hello, how are you? Excellent, and running the ones and twos, our awesome executive producer. Hello, everybody, Phil Svitek here, excited to be here. Yes, excellent. This film, it, w it was nice, action-packed, a lot of um, social undertones and social classes. What were your overall thoughts of this movie? Well, I'll, I'll start off. Um, first off, I'll just say, uh, you know, I, I, Neil Blomkamp is coming off of District 9. Uh, really big movie for him. You know, personally, I wasn't necessarily on the District 9 bandwagon. Uh, I, I got it. I understood why a lot of people got it. You know, to me, Neil is a fantastic director. I think he just, his short fall is writing. Uh, mm -hmm. I had some issues with District 9 and Elysium, uh, even more so. Uh, first and foremost, like Elysium is a science fiction movie, but it's also a very highly charged message movie. Um, you know, it has everything from immigration issues to healthcare issues and a little bit of Occupy Wall Street type of issues, the have and have nots. And I think because it's, they hammer those messages home so much, I think that the movie itself sacrifices character development and plotting in order to get this message across. Uh, so for me, uh, there, were, there were things that I did enjoy. Uh, the direction was fine. Special mm -hmm. effects were great. Editing was fine. Performances solid across the board. But that movie, it just lacked in a lot of story and plotting and character development. There was a lot of things I didn't quite understand why people were doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, so for me, the best I can say about it is it didn't make me angry. Okay. I, I agree with you that the, I feel the storyline and the characters were underdeveloped because they relied so much on the visual effects and just the overall look of the mm -hmm. two atmospheres that we're dealing with, Elysium right. and, and, and Earth, the, the two differences. And I think because they relied on so much of the visual effects right. that everything else kind of just fell Always. Yeah, sort of. And the, the other thing, too, to me, is Neil Blomkamp seems to be, uh, you know, he's spearheading a new science fiction genre, which we can call third world sci-fi. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, L.A., or as I called it shortly after seeing the movie T.A., it's not what you think. I just called it Tijuana Angeles. Uh, it, you know, it looked very much <laughs> like, it looked very much like th what we saw in District 9. And in fact, I was expecting one of those mant creatures to pop up and say, hey, hello. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Phil, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I overall liked it. Um, you know, for me, what was interesting was the fact of, I, as soon as I got into it, I was really nervous that this is something that we've seen before about colonization and things like that and trying to get there. Um, you know, we've seen it. Uh, we've seen it with Blade Runner. We've certainly seen it with um, what's the uh, what's the other um, Philip K. Dick movie that was just recently remade? Um, uh, Total Recall. Total, Total Recall. recall. <laughs> there yes. you go. Um, so I was a little nervous right from the get go about that. Is it, is it just going to hit the same beats? But right. it was it was different. Um, and you know, initially too, I thought it was going to be kind of smaller scale where everything's just kind of contained in this rubble. And, you know, we had sh some shots of Elysium and things like that, but I was like, is there going to be any action? Is this going to be just a quick movie? Yeah. You know, because it only runs pretty much at around, like, an hour and 40. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I thought, you know, how – Yeah, I thought it was going to be very self-contained and small, but it, it got big. And, you think? Uh, I, I think yeah. by the end it, it did. Interesting. Uh, the third uh, act was a lot of action. Yeah, so. I mean, for me it was small. I mean, first off, let's talk a little bit about the plot, which is Earth – 
has just gone to pot um, due to pollution, overpopulation, whatever. The the highly disease rich, ridden. disease ridden, the highly rich build this 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 wheel in the sky that keeps on turning called Elysium. They're the only ones who live there. Uh, and the have-nots are on Earth, and they can they look up into the heavens, and I mean that literally. They look up into the heavens. Mm-hmm. They're constantly reminded that you know that the one percent is up there living life. And to me, for this movie, it was um, it wasn't global. Like we only focused on the Los Angeles area. We didn't know mm-hmm. how any other major city country was affected. We didn't know anything about politics we didn't know did government completely collapse and fold like what's going on like we were it was again because i think of the message of immigration and and such it just focused on this and to your point too with elysium you know you got this beautiful paradise but i never got a sense of the society what do people do there outside of sunbathing and whatever Obviously, there's some semblance of an economy, mm. but we don't see people working. We don't know. We know that there's a government in place, but who really runs this place? I felt that the movie was small compared to other movies. We can even go as recently far back as our first movie. That, well, that, you, you, let's talk ahead. about Neil. Um, sure. Only because I think, you know, that's a great it's, – it's, it's his movie. He wrote and directed it. Sure. Here, uh, you know. And so I don't think you can talk about the movie without talking about his history. Absolutely. How, how much do you guys really know about him as, about, as a human? Being? As a human being, I've never met him. He owes me money, though. <laughs> does he? I <laughs> yeah. bet he does. I, I know that Neil, he specializes in visual effects, and yeah. that's how he conceptualized Elysium. He didn't really write a, a set script, per se. That sure. He sent a bunch of like 60 to 70 images of concept art sure. that he drew out. And he gave to um, Rito right. Digital Studios, and so from those c- um, concept developments, then the story came along. He, right. So I can understand why um, the characters and storyline kind of fell through because he focused so much on the visual aspect mm-hmm. of the movie. Yeah, I mean he's a he is a he is a known uh, believe it or not he's a big uh, Michael Bay fan, um, and he tries to and you can notice a little bit of that. And I got no problem with that. And he is a solid director. Uh, I just, again, I think that writing-wise, um, what he brought to the table in this movie, it really lacked to me. Um, I mean, Phil, like you... Well, he, he grew up in South Africa, right. and so he's no certainly no stranger to apartheid and things like right. that. Yeah, I mean, he, granted, District he, 9. He's, only, <laughs> he's only 33 years old, so he's, he's fairly young. Um, and I don't know, uh, it just seems... Uh, as as aware of the world as he is, he seems also unaware of it. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's yeah. you know, and and that may be an ignorant statement, but um, you know, I I think he's bringing to light sort of these opinions, but um, he never makes any conclusions about them. Yeah, sure. and seem- agreed. This is his second right. feature film, so again, he is a bit inexperienced in the directing aspect. So he might again, he's learning. He's bringing amazing visually sure. amazing films, but. St- Still, his he still has to work on concept development of characters and yeah. storyline. I mean, direction. I think I, I actually think like I'm. A, I like his direction. I like his vision. I like he, the way he makes things look. But yeah, to your point, you know, I think um, when you go down character breakdown and everything, yeah, we are talking. We don't know. Glo- Again, I was going to use the example of of a recent movie like Pacific Rim. It's not as message heavy as this yeah. movie. Obviously, it's a different science fiction movie. I understand that. However, you did get the sense that what was going on in Pacific Rim was global. I mean, it it affected globally so everything that was going on. Uh, I'll even go back and say Avatar. You know, when you were in the world of Pandora, which was completely, completely made up yeah. by James Cameron, another message movie, um, but you completely got a global sense of Pandora and how... What was happening there affected all the regions of Pandora. Well, here's, you know, th- it's a good example of Avatar. I mean, how, he, the guy spent, what, 15 years about okay. writing this movie. True. And, and also part of the reason why he did that was he waited for um, the specific Technology and the come techni- up. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when you spend that much time kind of thinking about this one thing, um, sure. y- you're much more apt to succeed. <laughs> um, no, it's, tr- yeah. it's true, mm-hmm. you know. And, and so with uh, Neil – I think uh, he's very good at identifying all these different things, right? Sure. Te- we, how many times have we seen movies about technology and, like, you Absolutely. know, and, and kind of robo- robotics synchronization of our bodies and things like that? And so, sure. you know, he's hitting the right p- 
points and he's wondering he's asking the right questions um but I think you know it, it, it would have been interesting. Could be I think following the successes of District Nine, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, people tend to give um, directors kind of leeway, and especially with the story. So I think I think they could have helped them out with the story, especially if you know he's such a great visual director. Just have someone come in and say, hey, you know, here's how you got to hit beat by beat. Sure. And it's interesting, you know, real quick. I, I kind of want to touch upon this. Um, I was at Barnes and Noble, and there was a District Nine or not a District Nine, uh, Elysium book already on the yeah. artwork. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this, sure. and I was, I was looking at it, and I was very fascinated by the fact. Okay, this movie hasn't has barely come out. Yeah. And I'm, I, you know, if I wanted to, I could know the whole backstory and kind of know the world. And so, but you know, it's interesting how. Okay, I don't want that to be a crutch. I, I didn't look at it specifically, and I don't think you, you know, fans should kind of look at a book to understand the the world of a movie. I understand. It's yeah, oh yeah, I get it. It's I'm not sure. supposed to be the oh, definition. Yeah. I agree. And I let's agree uh, let's quickly talk about the two worlds in this movie. We have yeah. Elysium, mm -hmm. this new world type of not really a planet, it's more like a space station. Yeah, it's a space station. Sure. Um, that inhabits all the rich and wealthy um, people who have sure. fled Earth. Mm -hmm. They live there and they have these what they look like t tanning beds yeah. <laughs> that can heal any human disease. Any human disease. So I thought the overall look for Elysium was really, they they showed that it was a really clean and Absolutely. sterile environment, completely a place of happiness. Oh, a yeah. A place where you want to flee to. Well, that's what Elysium. Paradise. It was yeah. utopia. Yeah, and that's what Elysium means. Uh, you know, it's based off a Greek word, and essentially it's where gods go to die or and and it is a place it's a paradise mm -hmm. and that's what they built up in elysium and yeah it's lush green beautiful water and nobody can ever get sick um you know and again when we talk about like the haves and the have nots i mean to me um again it's just when we look at certain things especially because it was so la centric you know number one you know i i have to wonder like, what does, you know, what does a Latin American person think of this movie? Because it's sort of kind of stereotypical if you break it down when you look at it. Because basically, when we opened up the movie, I mean, L.A. is Mexican. It's basically a lot of Latin Americans. It's, it's a speaking. lot of the third world but, countries that can't afford health care. But it was, yeah, it's whatever. a lot. But but they were speaking Spanish. They were, mm -hmm. it was very. Yes, and what happens to L.A.? It looks like Tijuana. It's uh, overpopulated. It's overpopulated, shanty towns, and, you know, it was very, a lot of, like, cholos around, and some people work, some people don't work. And to me, I'm, like, going, okay, that's fine, but what are you saying about Los Angeles? What are you saying about that sort of, like, geez, when they come into town, like, it looks like this? Mm -hmm. And then in Elysium, like, you don't, you know, there have to be some semblance of uh, an affluent, Latin American person to go up there, but I didn't see but a one. So I thought yeah. that that was an odd, interesting choice. Um, and then to take the immigration thing a step further, there was this whole immigration story about you're a citizen. If you're not a citizen, you're not allowed up here. It wasn't even a tax bracket. It just said you're either a citizen. And there's one scene in the movie that really just stood out for me. It's, um, again, to refresh everybody's memory, Matt Damon, uh, he, um, he's a worker, uh, and uh, he gets irradiated uh, at his job, lethal dose of radiation, and um, his, he wants to go to Elysium. Always has since he's a kid, but now he really needs to go. He's got five days to live. He's given the opportunity to do it, so long as he comes back into the fold with his, I don't even know what spider is, but... He is the head of the underground, so to speak. He can get you a passport yep. to Elysium, a, an illegal passport. And he asked him to do this one job. And that's hijack hijack the brain. This is a Philip K. Dick story. Hijack the brain uh, mm -hmm. and memories of a rich person who would have the keys to unlock the codes to Elysium. So they go forth. They do this. He has all this information in his head. Uh, he eventually gets to Elysium. They plug him in to do the codes. And what's the one thing that you saw that pops up on the big computer screen? Citizens, illegal. illegal. I mean, illegal was like the clear word. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it gets backspaced out, and then it's citizens, legal. legal. So the immigration message in this movie, I mean, it starts off with an immigration thing. You know, 
uh, it, it's so hammered into our heads. And I think there's even an immigration law that's going to be coming up in September or November mm, yeah. coming up. So, yeah, to me, when you look at the haves and have nots and what was done, you know, I got the message. I just wanted a little more character development from Matt Damon. Yeah. Like, seriously, um, in the beginning of the movie, he meets the sweet girl Fry. Yes, and speaking of Matt and the character, yeah. right, let's talk about the cast members. Sure. Matt Damon, he, he's the protagonist in yeah. the movie. What were your overall thoughts? Hey, look, I had no problem with the performances in the movie whatsoever. I thought he was really good. Again, and, and the woman that played Frey, uh, Alice Braga, I believe. Yes. Um, she was she was really good, too. And, the, and, you know, the performances are great. Again, I just wanted, you meet them as little kids. Mm -hmm. He promises so to her. They already had this. Yep. A lasting bond together. Absolutely, as little kids, and, um, and he promises her. Promise to. I'm going to take it to Elysium, Elysium as the looking up to the heavens, and uh, you know, then they go apart. They actually they they, they, they grew up. They grew up. Separated their own tracks. In their own way. Yep, and you find out that Matt Damon he became a car thief. He was in with this 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 spider guy and his group or gang. Uh, it wasn't so good because he was caught. He's, you know, when we see him, he's got the ankle bracelet on. He's on probation, mm -hmm. and he's just trying to get through life without, you know, just get through and life. And develops the job. somewhat of an attitude towards uh, toward authority figures, even the robots sure. that are on Earth, kind of controlling the Earth citizens. He, he's very condescending t to them, even though they're not human beings. Right. He has this overall. Um, hatred i Absolutely. should say towards technology te and, towards yeah. technology towards anything that can control him or sure. even to the elysium citizens yeah and he's got a meaningless job because describe to me what he did he put rivets into a just like a total recall yeah he put rivets yeah. into a thing that gets irradiated pretty much but that's all he did but and it shows that even the the citizens on earth are making these robots for people for the elysium well, right. you, you know, it's going in terms of the look of Elysium versus uh, the Earth. What was also interesting is every time you were on Elysium, it, the the shots themselves were composed uh, on much more mechanical things, right? So you had yeah. dollies, mm -hmm. you had jibs. It was smooth, True. right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. On Earth, it was chaotic. It was handheld hand and everything like that. And only later does chaos get introduced when uh, when the illegals, so to speak, come in. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and and it's true, and that's how kind of in terms of cinematography, that's how it was designed to be. Yeah. You know, and that's how they represented even uh, th even more so than the actual like set pieces, sure. the visual aspect of it. Oh yeah, yeah, it, and the feeling. Th there was a dichotomy between Earth and what was going. You know, what's here, and it it truly was better up there. Mm -hmm. um, but when when Frey and Matt and, and Max get back together again, some years have passed. Um, but certain things happened that I sort of kind of wanted to, like, if we had a little bit more background, like, Max is in an orphanage at the beginning, Frey's in an orphanage, they obviously had parents, and what's going on, there wasn't much backstory to either one of them that, when we get to a key scene in the movie, when mm -hmm. Max is talking to this girl, um, which ends up being Frey's daughter, Matilda, we don't even really know, can we guess that Matilda was maybe Max's daughter that he didn't know about? Or who was she? Like, we didn't know yeah, anything didn't about these people. Yeah, we didn't get anything about the father of yeah. Matilda. And it, but it goes to show that even though these Max and Frey have separated, they're still, uh, they still have something in common. They both have to go to Elysium. At first, they wanted to just go there and live there and have right. better lives, but now it's is that they have to go there. They have to go there. There's and no option because her daughter is dying and yep, she has Max leukemia. is dying. Yep, yes. Max is dying, the daughter is dying. But there's a scene where, you know, Max is in the house and the daughter, just out of nowhere, starts reading to him and he actually stops and listens to her. And it's sort of kind of, for me anyways, it came out of nowhere because there was no tie between him and Matilda. There was no like nothing at all. And again, getting to Elysium, we knew Max's reason to get to Elysium, and we knew that once we found out that, that there was a sick girl, mm -hmm. it telegraphed well ahead that there was some way that they needed to get to Elysium. And I thought, I even thought the way that they got um, Frey and Matilda into Elysium was sort of kind of a cheat, because when this Kruger character, who's like the most non-secret secret agent uh, going on, 
uh, when he comes to the house to question him, he sits there and he just decides to take him for the ride. He doesn't use him as, as leverage. He doesn't say, hey, Max, I'm going to blow this little girl's head off. He just says, you're coming with us. No reason, not whatsoever. It's not within his character, but for plot convenience, they had it to keep gets the story going to go to Elysium. And speaking of Kruger, Sh Charto Copley, yeah. he was also in District Nine. Absolutely, he ultimately ended up being the big baddie in this movie. Absolutely. I thought it was going to be Jodie Foster's yes. character was the person that we're going to be fighting against, but mm -hmm. it's actually Kruger. Yeah, and I, I liked his character. I thought he was interesting. He kind of played the special force mercenary sure. guy who lived behind the lines. Yeah. And but the interesting thing about his character is that even though he's kind of associated with Elysium citizens and sure. kind of treated as such, they st Elysium citizens still went against him. Oh you know, yeah, well he's psychotic and like you understand why. You know, again, one of my things about the movie is like at the beginning when those three shuttles go off to Elysium. Jodie mm -hmm. Foster calls this guy up to shoot down three ships. Like, I was like going, wait a minute, does Elysium not have their own defense system? Like, they have to call a guy on Earth uh, to take uh, out this wicked cool gun, don't get me <laughs> wrong, and to blow these ships out of space from Earth. Again, that didn't make sense to me. And he was supposed to be a secret agent, yet we find out when Jodie Foster is brought to the committee He's not so secret. Like, everybody knows that this guy's on Earth. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, what is he? He's a baddie. Um, but, you know, again, I think he could have made a drinking game for, you know, uh, every time he said, uh, what was his catchphrase? He said it like a Missouri, like, uh, what, do you, um, what do you think about that? Or uh, he, he was just, he was so bad. Like, mm -hmm. he truly was, like, the villain as opposed to, you know... He was mentally to and but physically he was good. someone that you oh, had to fight against. Oh, yeah. yeah. And he was crazy. He was, like, Bane crazy. Like, he could take... He took people oh, yeah, down definitely. without mercy. <laughs> and it was... Uh, it was... it was, You know, it was a violent movie. Um, more violent than District 9. Wouldn't you agree, Phil? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I would want to sort of agree, you, you know, and also the interesting comparison between this and District 9 is, uh, District 9, you had, uh, it was much more documentary-esque where you had interviews. True. You know, and mm -hmm. I'm glad, I'm glad, uh, this kind of went above that and, uh, and did it just kind of naturally, you yeah. know, just told the story the way that it progressed. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, and I liked, but I will say I liked him better in District 9, uh, you know, in this movie, he, he was just a baddie. He was just a really bad, off-the-page, um, uh, he was just off-the-page, just a bad guy, and you just knew he was a bad guy. And we should talk about Jodie Foster a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, if yeah, we you can, know her. You I do, I do. It was, uh, you know, it's I thought her great. character was interesting. Uh, honestly, Jodie Foster's characters in all the movies that she portrays, she's either hit or miss with me. I mm -hmm. like her in some, and I don't like her in some. This movie... I really didn't care for her character, maybe because she was just a, a sociopath a bit and having making all these commands to kill sure. these immigrants with no emotional feelings afterwards. And I think her, her accent of the character uh -huh. kind of threw me off. It, made it, it definitely distinguished the fact that she's sure. completely Elysium citizen. Right. She has no ties to Earth whatsoever. Yeah, and I think the accent, again, my, my thing, I think the accent, too, was to... Uh, punctuate that she's a bad guy mm -hmm. um you know to your point uh, regarding regarding the character of delacourt you know she was set up to be the bad you know she was set up to be the villain and again there was no there's no motivation like we i never got a sense of why she was the way she was and normally i guess you can sort of kind of go with it but there was one scene in particular that sort of kind of threw that out the window for me and that's the scene where she's brought to the committee and they're sort of kind of dressing her down mm -hmm. for blowing up the, the, the immigration transport ships. And the president is, is, is pegging her down a few notches, and then she takes the president to task. And she asks him this question, and he can't quite answer. And then she seriously, she goes, you can't answer that question because you don't have kids. You don't know what it's like to raise kids and stuff like that. So that throwaway line to me was like, well, so far in the movie, I haven't seen you be being a motherly mother i don't know that you have a family well she did she did remember they're doing the party or whatever and, and she's giving gifts away to kids so yeah, even if she but, doesn't i think there's something about but her you that 
can't say, yeah, I understand at the party, but I don't know who these kids are. And if you're going to have a line like that, show me something that maybe you don't see her with a family, no husband, no kids, like, or show me something of her family life where maybe, maybe her husband was killed by an immigrant. Maybe that's why she has such hatred towards them. Or maybe her, her kids are so sick. Like, do something that's motivational for this character to be as bad as she is, other than just scowling and she has the French accent. And well, I don't think it's around. so much as bad as just someone who would scorn, really, because mm. she gets reprimanded by people who are above her. Right. Therefore, she calls uh, John Carlisle to right. get the codes, the yeah. access codes, to restart Elysium right. all over again so she can be recoded to be the leader. The leader, yeah. So and it's not so much that she wants to kill kill people. She's just in it for herself. Yeah, and I get that. Again, where's the motivation to do that? Like, why does she hate? Like, I, I understand she's a one percenter, and because she has mm -hmm. money, she should be evil. Uh, and because she's French, apparently, she should be evil. But I'm just trying to figure it. Like, again, I was just looking for a little bit of motivation from that character to be doing these things. And again... When she blew those transport ships out of the out of the sky or out of the water, you could say, I was wondering. Like, I never got the sense that this hadn't been done before. Like, mm -hmm. they had this guy on ground, and maybe this had happened before. And you John know, Carlisle, it, yeah, or Carlisle Kruger. or Kruger. Kruger. And Kruger. and and again, what were the deportation processes on Elysium? Because obviously there was a deportation center. We see it. We, you know, we, we, we they don't... They just ship them back. They just <laughs> ship them back. But, again, how many times do ships go? And are they only coming from, you know, Tijuana, Angeles? Are they coming from Paris or New York? Or, like, what... I had no sense of what the system was up in Elysium. And that, to me, it sort of bothered me. Yeah, and it made me question, because we only saw three ships from Los Angeles. Right. And it doesn't cover the, all the world. the world. It makes me wonder how many ships did they actually shoot down? Yeah. And or how many attempted. citizens really did die? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. You know, uh, I, I know we're bashing a little bit of the movie. Well, I, you know, I, but, but we, we could talk about it. Let me ask you this. You know, uh, oftentimes you hear, uh, you know, that, that studios want to, uh, to shorten the movie, to shorten the movie. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt this movie needed to be a little bit longer. I, mean, I felt it, the same way. If anything, and, you know, and especially for a summer movie, like, you know, uh, I know John. It, it's actually good that we don't have John Comerford here because he always likes his movie very short and to the point. So he might actually love this movie. He um, might. <laughs> but for me, you know, especially with some blockbuster, I'm looking at it like, okay, well, if I'm going to pay money, then make it, make it three and a half hours long. You know, I'm going to enjoy you know, every moment of it. I Yeah, and I agree yeah, with you. With, with all the visual effects and whatnot, you, you kind of want more. You want to see more of that. So yeah. let's talk a, a little bit about the sure. visual effects that happen. Yeah, and, so. and, but to point just mm. for one second, I don't mind a long movie, um, you know, so long as it's good. Like, you know, you can have a two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour movie, so long as it's good and it has me enthralled and right there. Keeps your attention. I've been to 90-minute movies that have felt like four hours. So, you know, it be <laughs> yeah, right? I think we all have. Anybody yeah. who goes to the movies, there have been short movies that, God, when is this thing going to... I thought this was only 90 minutes. So I agree. It, it, to me, or you'll rarely hear me say it, but it could have been padded. It could have been a little bit longer. I could have gotten to know these people a little bit better, and I probably would have liked the movie a little bit more. So, And now, yeah, we can talk about the technical aspect, which I enjoyed. I, I liked the technical aspect uh, of the movie, so... I, I think visually it was stunning. Yeah, least I wanted to live on Elise. Yeah. You know? And the, I think the interesting is is that you had these people mm -hmm. who were dressed straight, like, uh, and I noticed the clothing, they were very, like, gray, metallic, mm -hmm. kind of monochromatic colors, yeah. but clean. Cl very clean. And whereas the... Almost septic. Yeah, whereas the earthly beings... Their shirts were like brown oh, yeah. and raggedy. It was more cotton compared to cashmere. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> cotton compared to, to cashmere, and I think it, it definitely showed the difference between mm -hmm. these two people. It's the have and have nots. Again. Yeah. Um. And it, did anybody have the option or, or the opportunity, I should say, to see it in like IMAX, like good IMAX, real? Oh, yeah, I did yeah, not. Yeah, Seventy not, millimeter. No. It looked beautiful. I mean, you know, at least at the very least, you know, I saw, you know, a great presentation of, in my opinion, a mediocre movie. 
but it looked great. The opening shot of Elysium, I think we can agree. Mm-hmm. Like that was just like wow. That that looked great. His special effects were good. And even for a short movie too, I thought his pacing. I mean, there was there wasn't a time I was bored. Uh, like in the movie, I was like the action kept moving. Johnny did the uh, not Johnny Damon, the Red Sox. <laughs> I'm thinking uh, Matt, Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, he was uh, that's funny. He um, you know, right from the get go. You know, we know he wants to get to Elysium. And he gets irradiated, and boom, he's got to go. There's a, mm-hmm. I like that. There was a time limit. I had five days to get better, um, to get into a med bed. So, um, but so the, the editing, I thought, was really solid. Uh, the camera work, I thought, was solid. And it looked the special effects. All the money was up on screen, I will say. Here's what, to, you know, to, to the story aspect of it, I will give him credit that um, at first I didn't know, you know, we kind of, in terms of the pacing, right? So it was a very good pace early mm-hmm. on. Um, and I didn't know exactly how all these different things were going to connect, you know, and, and eventually it made sense. So I will credit him on mm-hmm. that now. Again, you guys might disagree how successful that was, but at least, yeah. you know, it, it was kind of we saw different portions of things and, you know, we moved back in time and space and whatnot and, and kind of got – Going. Yeah, no, he put it together in very simplistic ways. I, I agree with you. And he kept it going. Like there wasn't, you know, we can pick apart various plot points, but he did keep it going in a sub- very simplistic way. It, again, I, I'm going to say when we talk about it being longer, I was thinking, I looked at my watch and I knowing the movie was a little over 90 minutes. I looked at my watch, it's about an hour in, and I was like, we're not at Elysium yet. Yeah. Like when are we going to get to Elysium like this movie's gonna have to hurry up because we know that it ends there um so that was weird for me that it took them a little while longer to get to Elysium than I thought originally the, so it was anybody did anybody else feel the same way um, about I, that? I thought it was interesting how they spent so much time on the this task that spider yeah sent um max to go get the codes that he needed from sure Carlisle I thought they they spent a lot of time on that storyline mm-hmm. very neuromancer william mm-hmm. gibson-esque as well and there it's somewhat there. of a shootout yeah and then, like a bunch of props different props sure. and l- let's talk a little bit about the the, yeah. the mechanical props Absolutely. that they use um from the robots to these explosive little explosive devices yeah. that you can s- literally stick on people and the person blows up in an almost a sadistic way yeah oh yeah it was yeah uh, you know the, the props and the weaponry it was interesting uh, how, again, the technology was used uh, because, well, let's look at, why don't we look at uh, Kruger? Mm-hmm. You know, he had technological prowess, obviously, but one of the main things that he uses to kill people was a sword. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, he goes old school and he eviscerates people or, you know, he used a sword. Hand-to-hand combat. Yeah, hand-to-hand combat. That was his strength. Um, you know, I, uh, the, the effectiveness and the ingenuity of using those, like that missile launcher he had, that thing was pretty cool when he took it out. It was like a, a big square bazooka that had four, yeah. four RPG missiles to take down spaceships of anything. So, yeah, the props were really cool, I thought, in the movie. Um, and also the, the camera device that they had that flying around kind of felt like Big Brother. That yeah. Elysium had eyes on Earth. Sure. Yeah, it reminded me of uh, I don't know how uh, anybody do Terminator the ride at all. Mm-hmm. The, the, yeah. They had those flying things, uh, you know, in that movie that had the eyes, and and you can see and um, yeah, you know, everything that was used to find Max and 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 the the imperativeness of getting Max because he had all his information in his head and he didn't know what to do with it. Um, you know, technology wise, again, I think it. You know, look at the cars. Too. Yeah. They were sort of and kind the of shuttles that they yeah, used. Yeah, they were very Mad Max ish. Very. very dirty. They're almost like the blockade runner in Star Wars, where it's like dirty, not as pristine. They were banged up, dinged up. Uh, again, it just shows the difference between these are the robots in Elysium and, yep. and this is Earth. You know, the one scene that I really enjoyed was uh, when Matt Damon or Max. Uh, he was talking to his parole officer, <laughs> which not even wasn't even a robot. I mean, it was just. A, it was something Talking that you would get mechanical. at a, it was, yeah it was a drive through yeah <laughs> that had a face with holes in the mouth and, and like it I was just, graffitied it all was over graffitied too and, and he's talking to this robot and that scene to me worked I, you know I thought it was very funny um, yeah and the, again I had no problems with the look I think uh, cinematography editing were all on all the money that 
was put into the movie, which is around 100 million, showed on screen. For yeah. me, you as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I 100% agree. And um, again, that's why for me it is surprising that it's not a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but overall, uh, overall it did work. And uh, you know, I, I did like. Um, you know, it's interesting to me. You, you bring a good point in terms of when we're going to get to Elysium. Yeah. And uh, you know, obviously, I knew that we were going to get there. It would have been interesting. You know, I was kind of always concerned. Okay, is he actually going to get to Elysium? I know he, he has to, and he's gonna. They're going to accomplish their mission. But, and as we're spending so much time on the mission of getting the information, sure. I liked how it kind of came back. You know, and that was the key that Spider needed, and, and that's what's going to progress forward because. I knew initially it was always going to be a very selfish reason for him to just go. Sure. You know, I was like, okay, okay, if, if, you know, especially with the way we built it up with, uh, you know, um, nuns and things like that. And so, yeah. You know, everyone mm-hmm. has a purpose. <laughs> and if your purpose is very selfish, it's not a very good right. message, is it? Especially if yeah. you're going to heaven, which is what Elysium stands for. All right. Yeah. You're right. And so, you know, so it made sense eventually, and I liked that it took that turn. And, you know, almost kind of what he's saying is that fate will – choose your destiny for you but i mean again the telegraphing for me i mean was there at any point again spoiler everybody <laughs> uh max character sacrifices himself that means he dies, he dies for the, the good end. of 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 humanity let's say you sort of knew i mean yeah i figured that that was going to happen you know the moment he met the sick girl i was like okay these things i it was just telegraphed from a mile away like you had a feeling that it wasn't going to end too well for Max, other than the fact that he was going to have the epiphany that he yeah. was meant. For here's a big here's thing. for me. I I I, uh, I was hoping they would work against that convention. Yeah, me because too. Because it is a convention. I mean, how many times do you see it? You know, go. It, the funniest one to me is the Omega Man. The, I was just I was thinking, <laughs> exactly. I was thinking the Omega Man. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So. Go yeah. ahead, Marissa. I, I was kind of thinking Armageddon, <laughs> but yeah. it, as terrible a movie that was. <laughs> But it shows that the protagonist is willing to sacrifice himself for the betterment of everyone. So the fact that like all the citizens can right. be legal and can have that same somewhat fairness as sure. the Elysium cities yeah. citizens. But didn't you find it, uh, you know, again, when we talk about technology and they made it a point in the movie to talk about technology, you know, it would be great to mm-hmm. be a real estate agent, I thought, in Elysium <laughs> because, hey, you can get this 20-bedroom mansion, 20-bedroom, five-and-a-half baths, and two metabeds. Come with this. Like yep. every place had a meta bed, and there were so many meta beds. It's like, okay, again, like you can't afford to send one of these meta beds down to a hospital. You can't do like, it was one of those things. Like technology was there, but was it really? But it shows the selfishness of the Elysium. Yeah, it. it but if they could make it, they know that they have them. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't know. Again, it but just then, goes through all. Yeah. They had they had some technology down at Earth, but they knew these meta beds. You know, and again who's making these decisions like the president patel seemed to have some semblance of sympathy mm-hmm. but i mean are they running things from up there like gods w- which you know if you take it from the definition of elysium it could be that or like who's running things like where because but, at the end mm-hmm. who ends up making the decision to send the emergency medical evac things to earth it wasn't a president or anybody who said let's do this it was the computer that yeah. said, citizens, legal, send help now. And so does technology run things? I, I, again, I was just getting, trying to figure out all this stuff. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but yeah, these and, are the And it goes to show, now. because this movie does take place in the future, it shows that maybe humans kind of become technology in mm-hmm. and of itself. Even Matt Damon's character, he has to <laughs> have this biomechanic suit literally welded to yeah. him. And I like the fact that it didn't really take him over mm-hmm. it like he still had part of his human side would still retain his humanity right but the fact that he has to download information and literally into his head and even yeah. the ceos of elysium can download information yep. they're part computer they're part absolutely techno um technology so it shows that maybe eventually the, those two lines of human and technology they just bleed together sure absolutely read read if you haven't uh, i would recommend read neuromancer I mean, we're geeks here, so maybe a lot of you have. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is William Gibson's uh, first book, and it's exactly what you just said. It's about plugging in, getting, you know, getting, he invented the term internet. He coined mm-hmm. that phrase and getting into the system. And, you know, I always find that, you know, the, 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 
the meshing technology with humanity. Uh, Blade Runner had it. Star Trek did it a lot. And, uh, you know, and again, I'll, I'll just bring it around to Star Trek. You know, back in the 60s, uh, Star Trek second season had a had a episode called The Cloud Minders. And this episode, this one episode was exactly about this. It was about these people who lived in the clouds. They lived in the heavens. They had these other people mining for them. They were definitely a lower class. And the lower class was rebelling because they had it really great up there. And down there, it wasn't so great. And they were dying. They were mining for this ore uh, that kept the stratus, you know, these cloud minders, these people in the clouds, it kept them safe and, and, and happy and everything. And it was really interesting. I was like, oh, this is an old Star Trek episode. Mm -hmm. um, everything comes back to Star Trek. So, you know, um, yeah, I think, again, good movie. Uh, like, it was good to the point where it looked great. Uh, you know, I just have a lot of story issues. Yeah, and like yeah. the writing was underdeveloped and yeah. characters were underdeveloped, but the visually it kept me going. Mm -hmm. Like I it was eye candy, really. Yeah, I was never bored. Like, and, no. and the people that I saw it with, they were like, "Yeah, yeah, no, it was a fun movie." And you know, it's for me, I think we talked about this before. Why are we more forgiving on certain movies than other movies? And yeah. I was oh, we had this conversation where we were talking about Pacific Rim. Yeah. In Pacific Rim, you know, a lot of people brought up, oh, well, this is stereotypical. Oh, I've seen this character before. And, you know, but all in all, I had a fun time in the movie. And that's, for me, not the case with Elysium. Because once I started pulling that thread, everything else, you know, I've, I tended to be less forgiven in Elysium. It wasn't the fun science fiction movie. And you can have message movies. Science fiction should always be about humanity. Uh, I look at The Dark Knight Rises last year. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a message movie. It was an, uh, not meant to be an Occupy Wall Street, but it was about the have and have not. But we still developed character. We still had great story. And that movie was two hours and 20 minutes. It was. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> so, true. So, you know. The, the thing why I can kind of forgive it is because there are all these social inequality undertones sure. to it. And why I forgive it is because that does exist. It happens mm -hmm. every day. And, and it's today's society we have the upper class which are like the ceos and of elysium the the committee jody foster even carlisle who mm -hmm. and oh. who works for elysium yeah. but he's on earth and he even says the line don't breathe on me don't breathe on you. It was a great, <laughs> which i thought was lie. interesting because it just <laughs> shows that he he hates all these earth oh, yeah. earth citizens that he, he doesn't even want to breathe the same air as no. them so and we have the upper class and then we have the lower middle class, the the professional workings and and the and then the lower class. Lower lower the, class. All the people on earth working those part time jobs or even unemployed. Sure. So, so like there is this caste system that's so true. Yeah no absolutely I, I agree again. Do you think that I mean is global. You know, in terms of Matt Damon, um, and we can talk about all the rest of the actors as well. But do you, Matt Damon specifically, do you think he took that role because of the message he's done i mean you know he's yeah. done documentary work before um you know he speaking of wall street he did yeah. do the voiceover work for um i think it was inside man yeah yeah you know <laughs> and so i you know i think it appealed to his political views in terms of why he did it oh i i i wouldn't disagree with that at all i think for him it was probably again i don't know him so you know it's funny to talk about a gentleman i don't know but i mean if i had to think about taking the role it was an opportunity to work with neil blomkamp who made his who made his bones with this movie that was a message movie that worked really well called district nine the the plot probably um that plotting probably like he said wow okay this is an interesting science fiction story i like the way matt damon chooses his his projects he can do a born movie he can do a serious movie mm -hmm. Um, you know, this is a science. You can do controversial movie. movies, you such as so. Behind the Candelabra. Yeah, uh, like oh, absolutely. I like he has a wide variety yeah. of acting range, and I think the fact that he picked Elysium just more power to him because yeah, it just absolutely. shows his talent as an sure. actor. Sure, and he doesn't thumb his nose up to genre type films, and at the same time, we can watch him uh, viral video with um, with with Jimmy Kimmel. All the time so he's got a great sense of humor and right. he's from boston so you know he's he's a, he's a good guy from boston that made it good um so you know I'm a, I'm a guy from boston trying to make it good and trying to be a good guy but he i think i think to your point i think the political overtones may have been something when he read the script that says yeah i'm on board with this you know again without knowing him 
Uh, I think the project just fascinated him. And I like that he doesn't shy away from genre films. Yeah, and he even, Matt Damon even said in an interview himself, uh, the interviewer asked him if Elysium were a real place, he would probably be on it. And he yeah. acknowledged that he probably would. But yeah. he still doesn't see down upon others who wouldn't be in Elysium. So I just applaud him for thinking in it that way yeah. as well. Did you ask yourself while watching the movie how rich did you have to be to be on Elysium? Because I think it was like the 1%. Like, you know. I yeah, mean, it was pretty small. Yeah, yeah it was okay. pretty small And percentage. they never really, because Max always says, I have to buy a ticket. I have right. to buy a ticket. That's just buying the ticket. That's right. not buying all the houses and, like, actually living there, that right. lifestyle. And they never specifically said the certain amount of how much that ticket is. No, I have is. to buy a ticket. It's yeah. like getting a ticket to that, uh, you know, to the Virgin uh Virgin American or Virgin Atlantic space shot thing. <laughs> like you need to be uber rich in order to to go out in space. <laughs> is basically yeah. it. But I think I, it's fair to say that Carlisle and Delacorte were billionaires. Uh, yeah, I mean they had to be. And again, like um, Carlisle was interesting because he was in a position where, you know, his business that he even said that he grew might not be hitting its goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was a fear, maybe there was a fear for him where he would get booted out of Elysium. Like, if you if you fall down in tax bracket, do you get kicked out? Like, are you not allowed to stay up there anymore? Because uh, that was brought up in the movie. that the, He's like, yeah, don't worry, right. this is a business that I built from the ground. I'm going to hit my quotas. And it didn't matter what was going on because... Um, so Matt Damon... Uh, Max, he's working, you know, the door jams. So my first inclination would be just to shut the whole, just shut that down. Yeah, turn it off. <laughs> turn it off. But no, he just goes in there. But his boss says, fix it, go in there, uh, or I'll find somebody else who will. Yeah, and, and you, you know, you'll and, be fired. And, yeah, well. and he doesn't, like, just take the, just shut it off for a second. Mm -hmm. Go in there, move the crate, and get back out. But, you know. Again, we're talking about class structure where they they seem to be slaves almost to Carlisle. Mm -hmm. and, know, and they right? really are. And then Carlisle's um, position is to oversee this. Right. All these robots that are getting. Yeah, he's the pharaoh. Yeah. Yeah. And but going again, uh, going again. Um, when you said that he might lose the, this business of his might fail, it uh, shows that Delacorte promised him all these right. financial benefits sure. that he'll have if he you know, resets the whole system. Right. So it goes to show that Delacour is, like, he has way more money she has than way he more does. Money. Yeah, she had to be, you know, yeah, again, I think everybody up there was uber rich. Oh, like, exactly. uber, uber rich. And I think it was definitely a one percentile thing, but... To the point where you can't even fathom how yeah. much money they have. And somebody had to build that, yeah. that, that space station, too. Um, you yeah. know, and it was a constant reminder to those people who couldn't get up there that they're up there. That they're up there. <laughs> and, and that sort of it's stuff. Like literally out of reach. Yeah. Oh, completely. What, uh, Phil, in that book that you saw, did you did you go back and open it after you I skimmed saw it. the movie? I mean, okay. it's it, it's all the you know Marissa brought up that he drew a lot of the images. Yeah. And so it was it was the artwork of the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and again, I stopped myself. I kind of flipped through it just a little bit, but I yeah. stopped myself because I didn't. You know, a lot of the questions that we were asking, I, I felt uh, before I saw the movie, you know, would be answered too much, and I'd be going in with too much knowledge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I didn't want that. D let me ask you this: Did you like? Ooh, what did you like better, this or District Nine? Um, I would, I would say District Nine because uh, honestly, it was a it was a little bit of a smaller movie, mm -hmm. and for this, I felt, um, you know, and I got it. For this, I felt uh, this honestly could have been a longer movie, or it could have been a franchise movie. You know, oh, yeah, where we accomplished one, uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we, where we hit, like, uh, we, we hit certain beats. Right. You know, so at the end of this movie, we hit a certain beat, but the ultimate goal is to get everyone on Elysium, right. whatever that, you know what I mean? And so we could have kept that going. Yeah, and, and, you know, it's funny that you mentioned we, we could get everyone on Elysium. The 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 fix all at the end wasn't to bring people to Elysium, but it was to send <laughs> med beds down. To like, them. Yeah. We don't necessarily want you up here, but, but we're we'll, gonna we'll help, help you out. We'll, we'll cure you. Yeah. And we'll send a couple of med beds and in five minutes you'll be cured of all your Yeah, and face. I think that's where I kinda got upset at the end a little bit because yeah. even though they're still considered uh, they're legal now, legal. but is the social class the same? Yeah. Or are they still the lower class? Yeah. I Are they really equal? Yeah, it never really answered that. I don't think they're ever equal. 
Yeah. I mean, I didn't get that. It just like again to me was one of those things where it's such an immigration thing, where you know if you got to sneak into some place, if you have to cross a border and you're in immigration, you have to sneak in and get a fake passport, and that was brought up in healthcare. Healthcare issues. It's like in Elysium, there is no healthcare issue. We got these beds. I can have cancer, do whatever. But here on but you Earth, have to be a citizen. You, you have, have to be, to be a citizen. branded. And they weren't even considered citizens down yeah. here on Earth. But again. Was this just Tijuana, Angeles? Was it the entire right. world? Does everybody get med beds to fill beds? Well, I you, never know. What, what worries about Pacific Rim is they had a lot of use of TV news. It's true. You yeah. know, here, yeah, and I, I feel ultimately that's what, um, that's how they got away with, okay, even if we're going to spend time in, you know, they spent a lot of time in Japan and a little bit in the United States. Or, uh, Australia. Yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. You know, yeah. that that would have been an easy way to kind of update everyone because, you know, I, I was wondering how how do these people get their news? Okay, so this brand thing happened, but, okay, three, uh, car, three medical ships go down. They go to Los Angeles. You know, where do we stand with the world and how do they get their information? Mm -hmm. And which might speak to a bigger point of, you know, that they're – you know, not really educated, which Max's character wasn't. You know, it was Trey who was knew how to read. He didn't. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I felt also the language thing was a little bit strange. Which they, on on Earth or uh, like that they use either that they or use Spanish or either or didn't. You know, uh, it wasn't. It didn't define anything. You know, it was it was kind of. I didn't understand the reasoning when they used it versus not using it. Sure. You know, and it, it just became why. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes back to um, having education because Delacorte and Carlisle, they had education. He, Carlisle knew how to do coding. That's obviously education. And sure. Max is doing this menial type of a career job that yeah. he's, and he's lucky to have. He's a blue that collar. He's lucky, very blue collar. And, and yeah. all, all of them because he has to fight to get a job every day sure. <laughs> and, and to work. So there's even that separation between these citizens that they have wealth, they have Medis Medicaid, M Medicare, they have education, mm -hmm. and our citizens don't. No, they they clearly didn't, and uh, you know, and again, it just goes to the have and have nots, and you know, Matt Damon or Max, as you said, yeah, he, we open up in the movies in subtitles, yeah. you know, the movies mm -hmm. it, it's in Spanish and it's in subtitles, and it, it's a Spanish nun, and like again, you know, immigration for L.A. Clearly, they all cross the border. They all, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely all it's crossing Latin the American right yeah. there. It's all crossing the border. But, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was an interesting dichotomy, uh, yeah, to say the least. And Delacorte was so prim, almost improper in what yeah. she wore and how she walked. And, again, if we're talking performances. Fine performance, I thought, from Jodie Foster. I think if you're going to do an accent, what I, what I noticed, I grew up with a mom who's from Greece, okay? <laughs> and she has an accent. I grew up with that. That's all I heard. And the one thing, you know, I mean, she's gotten better with the English language, obviously, through years, and she went to school and everything. Um, but the one thing is, is that when you're first starting, for when your English is a second language or a third language, you know, the words in English almost seem to be forced out. And that's the way Jodie Foster played that. And I thought that that was... I thought she did a really good job um, in the way that, you know, I mean, you knew she was, I wish the character was fleshed out, but I thought she did a really good job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's a class act. Um, I think in the roles that she picks, I think, you know, it's nice to see her get back into science fiction. And I did. I had the, the fortune, uh, I was in a fortunate position where my first job when I came to L.A. is I was a P.A. on Contact. The movie Contact. Oh, okay. I was a kid in a candy also store. Also with William Fickner. <laughs> well, also with William Fickner, Jodie Foster is a Robert Zemeckis movie. I was yeah. a kid in a candy store, and I, my one Jodie Foster story that I have, which really, you know, just really puts her up, up up above a lot of people, is I worked for the costume department in the production office, and Jodie Foster came in to do a, a, a fitting. It was her first. You know, she was doing a fitting for all her costumes. I was briefly introduced to her. The conversation, if it was five minutes, it was, hey, Dimitri, or, or hey, Jody, this is our production assistant. Uh, Jody, this is Dimitri. Oh, hey, Jody, how are you? Nice to meet you. Can I get you anything? No, no, I'm all good, whatever, and fine. And we talked, and that was it. Flash forward a couple of weeks later, I had to go to the production office, and I was at Culver Studios, and I'm walking in the parking lot, going towards the office, and Jody Foster is walking towards me. 
I wasn't gonna, you know, I'm just I'm just the PA. I'm just going to the office. She walks by me. She just out of the, hey, Dimitri, how's it going? And I was like, is there another person named Dimitri around here? And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, she's talking to me. And she remembered my name. And I was like, oh, my head. I felt <laughs> elated. I was like, that's wicked awesome. I said, hey, Jody, how are you? Are you done for the day? She's like, yeah, going home. I go, I'm not. I go, you have fun. I'll see you later. That's the kind of woman that she is. I always respected that in her. I actually got to be on set and watch her work. She's fantastic. And, you know, I give her big creds for everything that she's accomplished. And I've been a fan since Freaky Friday, <laughs> watching the original <laughs> yeah, Disney um, movie. I have nothing against Jodie Foster. Yeah. I think she is a great actress yeah, overall. I think sure. this her particular character of Delacorte, sure. I didn't feel for her. Mm -hmm. Therefore, no. I didn't really care for this character. Right, I, and I agree. And a villain... This should be some motivation for the villain. I agree with you. Yeah, I didn't. So you don't feel for you her. You need to connect at least on some level, even even though you don't like the character. Yeah. You still, you, audience usually still connect yeah. to them in some way. I really had a disconnect with yeah. her, maybe because she was so sociopathic. Yeah, I think so. How about and you, Phil? What did you feel too? Uh, in terms of her, I really wanted her to be the villain at the end. Yeah, you yeah. know, instead of Krager. Cool. Uh, yeah, but um, you know. I, I, I thought she did a good job and, and, and it worked out well. Again, it, all these different plot elements that at the beginning I was like, okay, why are we going here? Why are we going here? Mm -hmm. I like how they, they did tie together at the end. Um, but I also do want to talk about the music. Yeah, yes, sure. Let's talk about this mu uh, the music done by uh, Ryan Amon, who, who's known for composing trailers for uh -huh. The Avengers, Watchmen, and whatnot. What did you think of the music? I, th I thought the music was... It, it was nice instrumentally, but then it had a lot of different elements to the standard composed music. Yeah, it almost, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the trailer thing. It almost felt in certain scenes that it, it was composed for a trailer. And sometimes for me, it was a little bit of a distraction to the action going on. Because mm -hmm. it, it, seem, it, it didn't seem, I don't know, there was something about it that to me, I was like, I'm not going to run out and buy the soundtrack. I'm a soundtrack guy. I love but like if it, there's a score, I bring, I buy the soundtrack, mm -hmm. listen to it a lot. To me, at times, I felt that the music was sort of kind of a distraction. It seemed to be fit for that particular fight scene, whatever. And I guess, in a sense, like a trailer when you've got a short burst going on. So yeah. that, that's how I sort of kind of felt for it. And it's been said that he actually, um, the director Neil, went up to him and asked him to compose this music without haven't seen the film yet okay. so he neil let him have this range of freedom yeah. with the music and um it's been told that he for the score he used like baboon calls mosquitoes uh -huh. like a lot of different sound effects that you wouldn't normally hear in a composed right. score music score which is fascinating but again with those weird ambient sounds it really reflects the atmosphere mm -hmm. of earth because of sure. all the random things that are happening in the over crowding and overpopulation sure. of Earth. So I think it reflected it in well in that way. Yeah, what did you think, Phil? Um, I overall liked it. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, it definitely kind of had an inception. Yeah, I think a <laughs> little bit of homage with mm -hmm. the uh, with the uh, heartbeats. I mean, yeah. here, I'll, I'll play, uh, I'll play this again yeah. for you guys as I talk. Um, you know, and just that yes. coming in. Very um, inceptionist. Yeah, right just, there. Yes. Just right, right there. there. <laughs> um, and so, but I, but I liked it and I, I liked how, you know, they had those moments and then they slowed it down uh -huh. to where there was nothing. It was just, you know, and they had great moments of hyper reality, Yeah, you know, especially from Matt Damon's character when he's kind of looking about and, uh, when they really go to his point of view on certain things, yeah. um, I thought those were really brilliant, you know, yeah. and especially, so, uh, when... I think I think it's Spider's uh, plane when it comes down. Uh -huh. Actually, no, it's not Spider's. It's um, it, it, I'm sorry. It's uh, when Matt Damon finally gets to gets Elysium. To Elysium. Yeah. You know, just everything quiet. Quiet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Until we hit that um, the a White House. The wha <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pretty much. Unintended That's or right. unintended, <laughs> you tell me. Um, oh. no, like I like True. the music. It's it's actually fun to listen to the the soundtrack. Um, Did I, you have it? Do you have it? Do, will you? I, I will listen you to buy it. On I personally would not buy okay. it, but I highly suggest to people to listen to it right. and just get that feel for what the music is. I wouldn't suggest people to fall asleep to it though. <laughs> <laughs> so no. it, it's it's one of those fun epic kind of soundtracks. Okay. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Again, it wasn't anything that I that I would run out to buy. Um, 
you know, when you just played that song, God, yeah, it was very, very Inceptionist. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, for me, it was, it was, it was fine. It, it was, you know, it was there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't love it, didn't hate it. So yeah. And so over overall, this movie, I enjoyed it visually. It was fun. Mm-hmm. Do you think this movie will still be relevant in the 140 years when it's actually? year 2154 because of the current storylines that are relevant now do you think it'll last that and still be relevant then that's a great question i mean is, is this a time capsule movie um not entire i mean it's definitely for today absolutely it's relevant i think if people look back at it you know if they want a thumbnail sketch of history like just a quick something simple to understand what the haves and have nots and immigration problems that were going on today it could it could stand that test of time uh you know i don't think i think district nine might be remembered uh i think more, more, more. i think personally uh, you know I, I would you know we had prometheus prometheus come out um you know recently yeah however you wanted to define that term but for me recently and uh, you know where there was so much hype around that movie that even even with the faults that many people had with that movie, it, I th- I believe it'll kind of continue. Whereas this movie, um, you know, there were aspects of it that were good, but I don't, you know, uh, I mean, are we on par to, to good why like money wise? We're at thirty point five million. Sure. You know, this yeah. is Sunday, uh, two days after its release. Is that? What does that show us? Well, I think um, if you're reading certain things this morning, I think it, I, I believe some people's perceptions would be that it underperformed. I think they were hoping to do at least what District 9 did for when it opened up wide, and I think they wanted it to do 35 to 40. Now, in the long run, um, we'll see if it has legs, you know, see how it does this week. Uh, people seem to sort of like it. I think it got on Cinema Score, I believe it was a B. Yeah, and IMDb it was rating of seven point two, and Rotten Tomatoes it was uh, audience was seventy one percent. Yeah, and what was yeah. uh, what was the Rotten Tomato score? Last I checked, it was sixty five. Okay, 65. I thought it was sixty four, which is okay. You know, I mean, yeah. for a science fiction movie, sixty five is okay. I think a lot of that is given to Neil Blomkamp. I mean, people yeah. were really looking forward to his next movie. movie. I'm looking forward to his next movie. I mean, I think he is a fascinating visual director. And I'm wondering, though, I, I would like to see him not do a Shantytown movie. I'd like to see him do, you know, he can stay in science fiction or maybe a flat-out action movie. I, I don't know. I, I'd be curious to see what they give him next. Well, yeah. I, I think, you know, I think you have to kind of give him a script to do. Mm-hmm. That's not his own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and go from there and, ma- and, you know, make it his own through the visuals and things yeah. like that. You know, because I think, I think directing actors and, and, again, we've all already talked about the other yeah. technical aspects. He's great. He's, yeah, he is. You he know, but what was on the page, you know. So, overall, yeah. I think this movie was visually, aesthetically pleasing. Absolutely. It was amazing how they sure. executed it and whatnot. But I think because of the social inequalities and mm-hmm. undertones, that kind of is sensitive with a lot of people. Sure. Why they might look down upon this movie or frown upon it. But overall, I, I did enjoy this movie. It was a nice summer popcorn movie. Yeah, I just wish, like I said, I wish the message didn't overshadow. I wish it didn't I wish it didn't go for that to sacrifice plot and character exactly. development. I felt that the performances were fine. Uh, nobody lost me. Nobody made me groan. Um, I was there. For, you know, uh, um, Braga, uh, Alice Braga, uh, she was in Predators, uh, which I had completely forgotten. So she's in another science fiction movie or a sci-fi movie there. And... You know, she was really good. I, I liked her. She was very sympathetic. And as a mother, I understood when she said, my life is complicated. I got more of a sense of her character than I did of Jodie Foster's character. Who or any of the Elysium. Could have been, right. Because we didn't get the storyline of any sure. other Elysium citizens. They are sociopaths. We didn't care for them. They didn't no. care for the Earth citizens. Yeah. But I did like this movie. Yeah. And uh, so please, everyone who's listening sure. and watching us on YouTube... Sure. Go to iTunes sure. and rate and comment. Tell us your thoughts. Yeah, on tell this us your thoughts movie. on this movie. Like, I mean, we I think read all a, the comments. I think it's a divisive movie. I yes, think people absolutely. will either love or hate it. Phil, any last Phil? parting shots? Uh, you know, over, overall, I did enjoy it. Um, it, I didn't know much going into it. I saw the trailers and things like that. I, I really wish, I wish this could have started the Oscar kind of trend of movies. I sure. really did. You know, especially since sci-fi doesn't always get to be looked no. at, and I thought it could. I. You know, uh, it's unfortunate that only every 10 years do we get, like, a Matrix exception. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I thought maybe we could have gotten one with this. Yeah. And, and uh, it was 
was just it, it wasn't quite there and time will tell where it stands with people yeah. sure and, absolutely and because i did overall enjoy this movie yeah. and the direction of neil blomka blom camp with this movie i will watch D- district nine you should so i mean I, I will definitely watch definitely that. now to to, to, to catch so. that out so no make your own decision folks we'd love to hear your comments yes and where can we find you you know i just set up a gmail account specifically for this uh <laughs> it is a uh, trek boy that's t-r-e-k b-o-y one seven zero one a at gmail.com if you'd like to uh say hey like what you say don't like what you say love this movie what are your thoughts on this I'll write you back. Excellent. And you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at Serafini TV. And Phil, where, where can we find you? Of course, here at AfterBuzz TV, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all that fun stuff. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much for Thanks listening. All. We Thanks will for listening. see you next time. From Bing.com, executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other after shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.